Welcome to the Marcus Freeman Show, presented by TireRack.com. I'm your host, Tony Simeone, joined by the head coach, Marcus Freeman. Coach, you get the win over Clemson in Notre Dame Stadium. This was a marquee win for you guys in the program. What did it mean to you and this football team? It was a special night. It was one that you'll you'll look back and, and wish you appreciated more and could truly capture those moments. But you know what I think it it was great to see all three phases come together. And, and what that creates is a, a belief in what we're doing, um, why we're doing it, and how good this football team can be. You guys have really turned the page last three games since the Stanford loss. What have you learned maybe about this process as a head coach that has allowed you guys to go on this run? Well, I think no win is, is too good and no loss is ever fatal. You know, the ability to level off of those ups and downs and be able to really get back to what is important and how do you improve and and it's never as as good as you think it's going to be um it's never as bad as you think it is but uh it's ability to continue to get back to where you need to go to and, and find a way to improve coach appreciate it we'll step aside when we come back we'll break down the entire victory over clemson it's on the marcus freeman show presented by tireact.com Welcome back to the Marcus Freeman Show presented by TireRack.com. It's now time for this week's game breakdown. Coach, you knew Clemson coming in undefeated, fourth ranked team in the country. It was going to be a great environment in prime time at a packed house. What was your message to the team before they got ready to run out for this big game? Well, I want them to focus on one play at a time, you know, and I know that can be coach's speak, but the last play cannot affect the next play, no matter if it was good or bad, and focus on each moment, but also understand that we're evaluated off of did you do your job or not, right? It did us as coaching staff do our job, did you as players do your job, so go out there and do your job, and uh, they did it. Feels like every week that we meet, at least the last month, we've talked about a big blocked punt, and we talked about the couple in the UNLV game, impact one in Syracuse, but this one's the biggest one of the year, obviously. Not only was it a blocked punt, it leads to a touchdown. It's the first points of the game. The place was rocking. Just try to put into perspective for me how impactful that blocked punt and score was to set you guys off on the direction you went. It was huge. You know, I remember challenged those that group on Friday, and I told Coach Mason in that punt block unit, and I said, listen, you're not surprising anybody, mm -hmm. but when teams know you're coming and you execute and do what you're supposed to do, it doesn't matter. And that's what happened is they were able to execute. You know, Clemson knew we were going to come after that point and they executed in a backed up situation, did an unbelievable job of doing what we're supposed to do. And then to turn that into not just a block pump, but a touchdown was huge to go up seven, nothing really started this confidence boost for our entire team that kind of took off for the whole game. 263 ground yards, he had 200 yard rushers, but when you guys commit to the run the way you guys have, what does that say about the identity of the football team? It led to a touchdown on this drive. We wanted to get out of there as even as we could because we were going against the wind and the wind was going really hard. But to be able to run the ball on an 11 play drive, um, I think it took about six minutes off the clock. That's huge, you know, and to score right before half, it was one of those middle weight situations. Mm -hmm. Clemson was, I think, 60 and two going into the game and right around there when they won the middle eight. So I challenge our team, we have to win the middle eight and to go up seven nothing as the first part of that middle eight was huge. You know, you've been really aggressive throughout the year, I think on fourth downs, but I, I think it was, in, it was right before the interception, you guys elected to punt. And I, I have to sense, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, because you thought the defense was playing really well and making them go 90 plus yards was not in their interest. You elect to punt, put them deep in their own territory. Then Clemson makes the quarterback change and we see Ben Morrison make the first of his two interceptions just tell me about what that play and, and how great it was to see him get you guys that field position. Yeah, you know, I decided to punt because, um, you know, we had the, the, the momentum. We're up 14 nothing. Let's be smart. I felt like we can get the ball punted down inside the 10 yard line, and we did. And to make them try to go 90 yards was, was going to be difficult versus our defense because they were playing so well. And uh, we wanted to pressure him, and, and the interception was caused by getting pressure on him. He couldn't follow through. Ben makes a great play, and uh, then it kind of takes off from there. Then he makes the interception and runs it back 95 yards for a touchdown and the lid comes off of Notre Dame Stadium. Just talk me through the play, but also just what it was like to be in that environment when you go up 28-0 against a team like Clemson. Yeah, you're up 21-0. You're feeling confident, but as a head coach, you're never feeling confident <laughs> until the game's over. But, you know, I think you get three penalties on that drive and, and it's kind of like, okay, man, they're going down. They got all the momentum right now for this series. And, uh, 
you know, for Ben to get that interception, not just an interception in our red zone, but to take it back to the house was huge to, to, to really go up 28 points in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. You kind of felt like, okay, as long as we don't screw this thing up, man, this game could be over. And um, that was a huge play for us. I just want to bring him up because I think it's actually a good sign that Michael Mayer hasn't maybe been the focal point of the offense as much because it means other guys are producing for you. But he does get into the end zone with the touchdown. Statistically now, he's effectively the best tight end to ever play at Notre Dame. Just what has he meant to you this year? And just what are the what's the superlative you have for him this week when you think of Michael Mayer? Well, I think you said it. He's got probably pretty much every record here for a tight end at, at Notre Dame. So I wouldn't tell him to his face, but you got to call him the goat of tight ends at Notre Dame. And uh, you know what? He played well. You know, I, I'm more pleased with the way he blocked that game. Hmm. You know, he was challenged to, to block some some really good defensive linemen. He did a great job at blocking. And when he got the opportunity, and, and Coach Reese called the pass play and the ability to execute, man, that was huge. Last one I have is obviously everyone's going to remember the storm of the field, and it was a great environment out there. I saw you having to weave your way through all the traffic, but I think what I'm curious about is the locker room after, because whenever I talk to a football player or coach, they talk about that's really the moment you're going to take with you for the rest of your life. So to the best of your abilities, tell me what it was like in the locker room after the winning for Clemson. Well, it was actually shorter than you would think because we were waiting a while for to get everybody <laughs> in the locker room because of the, the, the crowd that was on the field. But um, I just wanted to congratulate them you know, and tell them how special this moment was for them. And, uh, you know, I appreciate their efforts. And uh, it's a moment we won't forget. But, you know, you have to call one or two guys up because they played really well. But it was a, a team effort. And all three phases did an unbelievable job. And I try to just tell them, soak this moment up. Enjoy tonight. Um, enjoy it on Sunday, tomorrow. Um, and then we got to get back to work because that's the reality. My mind goes straight into the next week. And I don't want them to be like me until Sunday. But um, <laughs> That's the first thing that came to my mind. Let's watch this film. Let's get the things corrected, and we got to get ready for Navy. So we'll be back with more after this on the Marcus Freeman Show, presented by TireAct.com. So, Coach, special teams have been a story here the last month specifically. I just want to know, from your standpoint, what is your special teams philosophy? Our philosophy, you know, we kind of have a brand called Chaos Kills. So we're trying to not just be special teams or special forces, but kind of put kind of this brand to it, have a little bit of fun with it. Um, within that, you know, the most important thing for special teams is that the culture of our football team, the program fundamentals of our football team that Coach Freeman wants everybody to learn shows up on film and is an opportunity for us to teach it to the whole team. Mm -hmm. So for us, we want to be tough, aggressive, disciplined. Um, in all phases of special teams, we want to try to be aggressive and put a lot of pressure on our opponent to try to create some chaos in the game and um, find a way to kind of change the momentum and have some fun. I want to ask about the Clemson block. We're going to get a chance to look at it maybe in more detail in a little bit. But just on the field, that was just an incredible moment where you guys got the points, obviously, first points of the game. There was a shot of you on the broadcast where you were super fired up, understandably. What was it like when you got that block, you got into the end zone, and you got the first points of the game for the, for the Notre Dame fighting action? It was surreal. I mean, it was just, what a night. I mean, it was incredibly fun. Um, usually when we make a big play like that, maybe I black out a little bit, get a little too emotional, uh, get a little fired up, but it, it was incredible. It was an unbelievable feeling. Um, what a way to start the game. Explain exactly how Botello gets through here. I know he comes right up the middle, but yeah. tell me schematically what leads to it. So Botello really starts, he starts in the right A-gap and then goes over to the left A-gap and 84 walks up and he checks. And the, our guys did a lot, pretty good um, understanding that they were checking and what they were doing. And before in this clip, you could see Ramon Henderson and Clarence Lewis and Jack Kaiser all pointing out that they checked. When they checked, then Jordan Batello went back over to the other side, which forced them to then check again. Then when they checked again, Jordan Batello went back over into this left A gap that you see right here. So he was kind of going back and forth to play games with them. In doing that, it created some confusion, I think, for them. Because you can see they end up snapping the ball with only one second on the play clock. Now we only end up getting three on three, but I think in the confusion, the middle shield was kind of confused on which guy he was gonna block. And Jordan Patello did a really, really good job of being able to just shoot through right at the direct angle of the block spot. What a magical moment for Prince Collar to be able to pick it up and guys to be able to spring him with some blocks to, to score a touchdown. Coach, appreciate the time, thanks so much. Appreciate it. When we come back, we'll go inside the play with Irish Intel on the Marcus Freeman Show, presented by TireAct.com. Welcome back to Inside Notre Dame Football, presented by TireRack.com. It's now time for this week's edition of Irish Intel Coach. Plenty of highlights from the win over Clemson. Let's start, though, with the defensive play that might not show up uh, on the highlight reel anywhere, but we wanted to focus on it because I thought your defense really set Clemson backwards on, on a lot of occasions early in the first half. Cam Hart's going to blow up a screenplay here. Just explain to me how he does that. 
we knew going into the game they were going to try to get a lot of balls to perimeter through screens through runs and the ability to change who's the force player who's the guy that has to set an edge to a defense is is always a challenge for a defensive coordinator and so this was a version of cover two where the corner now is your flat player mm -hmm. and cam hart does a great job of triggering here and beating a block you know i know 80 got a holding call i think mm -hmm. maybe one or two called against him early in the game so he didn't want to hold there but you know billy to beat the block of number 80 and make the tackle was a great play by cam hart all right coach so between the block punt for the touchdown and then the pick six, it's going to be kind of a competition to see which one's the more memorable play going forward. This is, though, a great one here in the fourth quarter. Benjamin Morrison already has one interception, gets a second one, takes it all the way back. Just tell me how he does it. Well, they're they're driving on this mm -hmm. this this series, and, and they've moved the ball. They got a couple penalties called against our defense, and um, second and ten here. They're in the red zone, and, and Ben Morris is playing man to man coverage, but they're also going against the wind here. And I think that has a little bit to do with the throw, but also Benjamin Morris and it being in a good football position, where you'll see he turns and looks at the quarterback, and, and is able to read that this is a back shoulder throw. The wideout doesn't get that read, and so Ben is able to be in a position where he can now pick that ball off and. The rest was God-given ability. He's able to take this thing to the house. He's running, and JD gets a, enough on Will Shipley there that he can't make the tackle, and I don't think 71 has a chance to catch him there. That was great that you pointed that out. I didn't realize that his head was around faster than I've maybe ever seen a corner. This is a great look you see right here. Right there, he gets his head around so he can mm -hmm. realize it's a back shoulder throw. Because if, if you never get your head around, they'll throw back shoulder all the time. Mm -hmm. But it's obviously a little bit of miscommunication between the, the quarterback and the wideout. But if Ben never gets his head around here, he's never in a position to make that play. Last thing I want to ask you about, you mentioned a little bit, but Marist, right away, uh, I remember listening to the radio broadcast too, he said that when the ball's intercepted, you got to block the, the closest receiver. He's the first guy that can make the tackle. If you get that done, it can go a long way for this far down the field. Just how big is this block for Maris? It's maybe a 95 block, 95 yard block, right? It is, it's huge. And so that's something you actually work on defensively. Mm -hmm. You work on how interception returns and, and who to block most, block the most threatening uh, opponent or threatening defender because it turns into an offensive play. Mm -hmm. And so we say there's one play on defense and that's a return. And this is the play um, that you're able to really practice and, and we do a great job of executing. When we come back, we'll have more on this week's edition of the Marcus Freeman Show. Presented by TireRack.com. Welcome back to the Marcus Freeman Show, presented by the experts at TireRack.com. It's now time for this week's Look Ahead, where we highlight Notre Dame's upcoming opponent. It's time for this week's Look Ahead segment, and as always, we are joined by Bill Reese after Notre Dame's exciting victory over Clemson on Saturday. Bill, I mean, that is why people come to Notre Dame, to play in games like that, to get the result the Irish did. It was obviously their most complete performance of the year. Just from your standpoint, what was your biggest takeaway after the game on Saturday night? Well, I, I think it really reflected how ready the team was. Um, offense, defense, special teams. Uh, we had great work leading up to the game. Um, the players were excited to play in it. It was too you know, obviously very um, storied programs, uh, primetime in uh, Notre Dame Stadium. It was a great atmosphere. And, you know, our players really responded. The fans responded. Um, it was a great atmosphere. And it was obviously for Notre Dame a great game. Every week we talk about a blocked punt. And they seem to get more and more impactful uh, with every passing week. Brian Mason's unit did it again. They blocked the punt. I think it was the first punt of the game. Not only do they block it, they get their hands on it, scoop it up, and score. I mean, what what a statement to make. Just how impactful is this phase of the game now? It seems like there's more anticipation for some punt plays at this point, Bill, than there are for maybe third and long in the stadium. It's just everybody is on the edge of their seat. Just tell me about the play and just what they're doing on that side of the ball right now. Well, you know, you know, first of all, the players have really brought bought into Coach Mason and how he has taken an aggressive approach on. Uh, punt block. Um, he's put, you know, really talented players on that unit. Uh, like I said, there's great buy-in. Uh, each week, there's a little bit of a, you know, different schematic uh, approach based on what type of protection it is. And, um, you know, each week he's found the weakness and exploited it. And when you can score on special teams, you know, whether it's a punt block, whether it's a kickoff return, a punt return, it's such a huge momentum switch. And, um, you know, it was something that I'm not sure Clemson really, uh, you know, responded to very well as, as the game went on. I think that really, you know, put a big jolt into their team right off the bat. 
We're going to talk about the big pick six and the two interceptions, frankly, from Benjamin Morrison a little bit later. But the first thing I wanted to mention was just I thought the defense in the first half, obviously they held Clemson scoreless, which is a testament to how they played and how Coach Golden diagrammed a a scheme for the game. But I saw corners making tackles on screen plays that were blowing plays up. Seemed like Clemson faced a ton of early third and really long. Uh, They hurt themselves with a couple penalties, of course, as well. But the way the defense came out, Bill, it just seemed like they were ready to go from the jump, like you said. And even when they weren't taking it away, they were making impact plays that made it so difficult for Clemson. Is that what you saw as well? Yeah, again, it was really good preparation. They knew that uh, it was important to win on first down and and then make, you know, second down, you know, even more challenging. And when they got to third down, it was going to be tough for them to pick it up. And, you know, that was uh, executed extremely well. Uh, There were a number of times you look up at the scoreboard and it was third and seven, third and eight, third and nine. And, you know, in those windy conditions, um, you know, it was really hard to, execute the the passing game whether you're going with the wind or going against it um, it plays a factor in the passing game and when they were faced with so many long yardage situations you know it was really tough for them to pick it up but it started on first down where they really had a great plan Obviously, the story on the offensive side of the ball, the first thing you have to look at is the running game, 263 yards. When we talked last week, Bill, we knew how talented the front seven uh, was going to be for Clemson. And man, it's a testament to the running game. Let's start with the backs. Audric and Logan both go over 100 yards on the ground. Just seems like they'd get a series here or there and they just would run it consistently. It looked like the, the guys we've seen the last month and they did it against some of the best talent they'll see all year. Well, there's no question about that. Both of those guys, and if you throw Chris Tyree in there as well, uh, they, they've really got a great understanding now of how the run game is laid out and where the cuts are going to be, you know, being patient, you know, having vision to see, you know, breaks front and back side, you know, when to lower their shoulder, when to dip the ball. It's really been a culmination of how they've just progressed as the season has gone on. And, you know, quite honestly, they – really, you know, complement one another. And uh, uh, when Chris gets his opportunities, you know, he's dynamic off the edge. So those three guys have really made a big impact. It's a great point you bring up about Tyree, because I think the other two are getting a lot of headlines, but he's made some critical carries and catches out of the backfield for that three-headed monster, really, uh, that's running the ball so well. Have to mention the offensive line. I mean, there have been some great lines here at Notre Dame. We don't need to compare them or contrast them. But when any time an offensive line is running the ball like this, it's just different than if they're pass protecting uh, immaculately. There's something about asserting their will. And this five-man unit, Bill, I mean, they have really, it seems like, somehow exceeded expectations every week over the course of the last month. They seem to really be gelling right now. Well, it's the same thing. They've played together now. They understand each other better. They right guard and right tackle now have worked together. The left guard and left tackle have worked together. And, you know, they their vision has is, is been outstanding. You know, those uh, defensive fronts, they don't stand still. They don't just sit in there and they're moving, they're twisting, they're stunning. And they did a great job of picking up all the different things that Clemson tried to do to try to slow us down. But every time they came, you know, with a stunt or some type of twist, we picked it up made positive yards and just kept the chains moving. I think we have to mention the quarterback too. The stat line for Drew Pine hasn't maybe popped the last couple of weeks, but I just think what sticks out to me is that when you got a running game like this, he's one protecting the ball to give them a chance to run it and not put the defense with their backs up against the wall. But two, a thing I heard too, uh, coach Freeman mentioned this week in his press conference, is just how valuable it is to have Drew manage the huddle, manage the play calls the way he is to manage the cadence, manage everything, the play clock. He's doing a lot of stuff that doesn't show up on the box score. And ultimately it's leading to wins, especially as you move into the month of November. Just what kind of maturity and development are you seeing from Drew that's allowing him to quarterback a winning team right now? Well, those are all things that he has to do is the pre-snap, you know, getting the play, you know, getting the formation, calling it. There were a a number of different tempos that were used in this game because you know, Clemson would move around on defense. They're really good at stealing signals, knowing what's coming. So the tempos kept them off balance. They were late getting lined up a number of times. So that, you know, that that starts with the quarterback and Drew has to be exact on how he, you know, maneuvers and manages, you know, the way that um, we do everything pre-snap. And then the other thing is, 
you know, he's six and one as a starter. And that's the most important stat line. And, you know, some days, you know, he's going to be called on to throw more and, and have to do more um, when he's asked to. He'll be up, you know, for that um, uh, opportunity. But right now he's doing all the things that can get us victories. And that's really the most important thing when you look at a quarterback. Last thing I want to hit on before we move our focus to Navy, Bill, is Benjamin Morrison. I mean, the first thing is I thought they threw at him a lot last week against Syracuse, and I thought he held up and held his own the way a freshman is, but he was clearly a target of their game plan. You knew Clemson, they always come in with really skilled receivers. For a freshman to have the performance he did with two interceptions in the second half, one that he takes back for a touchdown – in this kind of environment, I mean, it tells you he's got a lot of skill. Obviously, he's able to hang out there. But what does it tell you about the kind of career this guy can have during his time at Notre Dame? Well, you know, the one thing you mentioned is targets. And each week, the last, you know, three or four games, his targets have increased as people say, hey, here's a freshman. Let's see, you know, how good he is. Last week, he was targeted, I think, 13 times, which probably doubled what he was targeted the, the couple of weeks previous. So, you know, he really has responded. Um, they're going to start to stay away from him as what, you know, what they saw here. Um, he did a really uh, excellent job of covering those um, Clemson wide receivers. He does really well when he's off, when he presses. He's very alert in, in zone coverage. He has an extremely high ceiling. Um, you know, he's a very confident uh, player. He learns extremely well, and he's got a short memory. If he does get beat, he comes back and he's ready to play the next play. You know, he's a terrific young prospect. All right, let's turn our focus towards Navy. As Coach Freeman said, you get to celebrate the game for a day and then you got more work to do. And that's what they have this week. Uh, and it's always an interesting week and I think a, a fun week and one that Notre Dame fans always look forward to with Navy coming to town. Let's just start big picture with the history of the rivalry and just what it means for Notre Dame uh, to play Navy annually the way they do. Uh, what do you think it means uh, as, as a program when Navy uh, gets ready to match up against Notre Dame? Well, it's a great rivalry between two great institutions, and everyone knows it goes back decades. And, you know, it's really a great matchup of, you know, two high-quality programs. And, you know, Navy has been very competitive. And, um, you know, the wish or the option offense is very difficult to defend. Um, they play extremely hard. Uh, they're the least penalized team uh, in uh, college football. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're going to come with their A game. Um, you know, they have given, you know, everybody they played, um, you know, fits because of how they play both offensively and defensively. And they're well coached. Yeah, I was going to say, I was looking through the numbers and they've only, you know, they're three and six this year, but they've only lost by 10 or more. Uh, on two occasions, which means they keep the game close because they limit possessions. I know that's one thing I hear from coaches a lot when you get triple option is you have to be really uh, value you have to value your own possessions because you won't get as many as in a normal game. But I want to ask you about defending the triple option. Just what do you have to do? And maybe specifically with this team, what do you have to be aware of when that triple option shows up and you're on the other side of the ball defensively? Well, you know, you really have to stop it from the inside out. They're going to run the fullback a couple of different ways. They're going to you know, a option off of different defenders, but they want to get that fullback going so that you keep the defender, your defense inside, and you have to really honor that, uh, that fullback. And then they'll try to get the ball out on the perimeter a couple of different ways with the option, the toss, you know, there's just a lot of different ways that, you know, they can, you know, manipulate your defense. It becomes a math equation. They're going to, you know, find out where they have the numbers, where they have the angles, and then they're going to attack that. It's, very precise on how they want to do it. It's very methodical and they're going to go for it on fourth down. And, uh, you know, you got to be ready to defend all four downs. Let's talk about the other side of the ball. The Navy defense doesn't get a lot of attention just because of this, the offense and the triple option. Everyone keys on that. Uh, but as you said, solid on both sides, just when Notre Dame lines up against them, who are maybe some playmakers, but also just what can the Irish expect to see on that side of the ball when they get ready for them uh, heading to Baltimore? Well, you know, a lot of pressure They're You know, they're going to you know bring uh, up their safeties. They're going to bring up their uh, outside linebackers. They're, they're going to bring a lot of pressure off the edge. They have a couple of really good edge players. Jacob Bosick is one of their defensive ends. That is a very good pass rusher. I think he has six sacks. Um, he is very mobile. Uh, about 260 pounds at 6'4", um, you know, a, a real, real good player. And then they've got an outside linebacker by the name of John Marshall, 
who is very disruptive, creates a lot of havoc as a blitzer. They'll move him around. Um, he can play at all three levels of the defense. Uh, he's a really uh, productive player for him. So, you know, they've got playmakers on defense. They're going to put a lot of pressure on you. They're going to want to outnumber your protection. Um, you know, they're, they're again, well-coached and well-schemed up and can give you problems. Last one I have, Bill, is, is a little bit big picture, but there is so much energy and and enthusiasm about the program now going in the right direction after the game against Clemson. But we've talked about it. There have been a couple of disappointing losses this year for Notre Dame, and there's still three really important games left on the schedule. Just how does the program and how does the, the building and the facility make sure that going the rest of the way, the Irish take the same game plan or at least the same approach and intensity that we saw against Clemson? into the remaining three games this season? Well, you know, the, really the way we practice has been consistent all year. The messaging has been consistent. Um, you know, what is expected, the players really understand. And, you know, this is a new challenge each, you know, each week, uh, you know, playing against Navy. Uh, we're going to a, um, a venue we have never played in before. Um, it's their home game. Uh, so, you know, th there's plenty of challenges this week. And um, the good thing is, like I said, every week has been, you know, very much the same. Players know what to expect. Um, the preparation has been good. Um, so, you know, the urgency around the program has increased and, and keeps building as, as we, you know, get through, uh, you know, the, the latter part of the season. Well, Bill, always appreciate you taking some time. It was great to chat with you after Notre Dame's exciting victory over Clemson, and I look forward to talking to you next week. Tony, I look forward to it. Thank you. Take care. We now present the highlights from a recent Coach Freeman press conference. Yeah, um, it's good to be back. Uh, it's a good Monday, you know, and you know what, I did want to start off, I told Niel, she texted me uh, yesterday or after the game, and I told her I'm going to give them a shout-out because they got a, a, a season opener today. Um, and then I know Coach Bray and the men's, I think they start on Thursday. So, you know, again, it's, it's a lot of excitement around Notre Dame athletics and, uh, you know, wish those two teams the best of luck. Um, but just recapping last game, um, obviously Saturday, Saturday was a special night. Um, one that you kind of go back and reflect on you in the moment it kind of it's, it's chaotic right but you go back and reflect on it and it's so good to just you know one the atmosphere was unreal um you know I challenged our guys on Friday and you know I said listen we create the advantage here you know our fans will always support us but we make it a home field advantage by the way we play and they did a really good job, but the fans were unreal. The students were great. Um, this is a special place, and I think you, everybody saw that on Saturday. It was really good to see all three phases um, really come together and execute at a high level. Um, I love the physicality of our team. You know, we really played probably our most physical game on all three phases on Saturday night. You know, to see the, the effort they played with, the physicality they played with was really, really good to see. And it's important. That's a part of our culture. That's a part of the things that are going to make us successful is how hard we play and how physical we play. Um, I think you see a trust and belief in what we're doing and what's going to give us a chance at this current moment to have success. You know, and that's forever changing. You know, some of the things that don't change is, you know, the things we talk about, the golden standard, the effort you have to play with. But schematically and, and what we do um, in all three phases will continuously enhance and change um, with who we have in our program and what type of teams we face. And so um, it's been good. But as you all know, it's short lived. And that's the message that was to the team yesterday in practice that, you know, victories are short lived. And sometimes it feels like defeats last a lot longer. Um but we have to move forward. We have to turn the page and, and get ready for a, a, a Navy opponent that's tough and uh, that is a unique style offense that will uh, present some issues if you're not ready to go. And so we are full throttle getting prepared for Navy. So with that being said, we'll open up for questions. Second one, right? Tom, right? Marcus, the players may downplay it tomorrow, but to go from 0-2 to winning 6 of 7, how much additional affirmation is it? to see you guys ranked again after so many weeks? Yeah, it builds confidence. You know, it's a, a trust and belief in what we're doing. And what losing does is it creates um, 
you know, maybe a, a disbelief in what you're doing at times. Like, is this the right way to do it? But when you have success, you're ranked now. Um, you beat a great Clemson team uh, in the manner that we did. You know, it continues to reaffirm what we're doing and the belief they have in each other, the belief they have in, in both sides of the ball and, and um, how good this team can be. You said the Monday after the Stanford game, the last night game that they played here, you went back to your office and, and watched the game by yourself. That Saturday, this Saturday night, a little different as far as being, you still went back to the office? Yep. And uh, told my wife to get out, take the kids home, put them to bed. I got a film to watch. And, um, but that's my routine. That's what I love to do. You know, I can't go home and relax without watching um, the film. And so that's my way to decompress. And so it was a little bit more enjoyable this Saturday night than it was after the Stanford game. But, um, yeah, for sure, that's the first thing we did. Third row on your left. Thank you, sir. Coach, you, you guys did a great job defensively stopping their perimeter game. Was that a priority going into it? And secondly, uh, your secondary really rallied to the football. Was that the best you'd seen them do that? Yeah. So when I talk about physicality, when I open, that's that's part of it. The relentless effort to run after the ball. You see multiple guys finishing on top of piles, and that's what you want to see because that's that's a choice, right? It's a standard force, but it's a choice to truly run to the ball as hard as you can and to visit fi uh, finish with with physical intentions and that's what you love to see as a, a, a former defensive coordinator but also as the head coach of this football team that's what we have to do um as far as the perimeter that was a huge point of emphasis for us because anytime you play 11 personnel which is when an offense has three wide outs in the game and one tight end anytime you play 11 personnel teams and you're in nickel defensively you're going to get challenged on the perimeter you don't have that big Sam linebacker out there, as they did. They had zero. He was a big, thick linebacker. Um, we play with a nickel, and so teams will challenge you on the perimeter. But we had to defeat the perimeter running game. We got two holding calls early in the game that I think helped. Um, it helped us. It helped kickstart things. And uh, But our guys did do a good job of defeating blocks, triggering. We caught a couple cover twos versus um, outside plays. Right now, your corners are triggering. You don't really have to beat a block. You just got to trigger and, and be fast. And so, Coach Golden did a great job in, in game calling the game, but also our guys did a great job of executing. Uh, triple option. Are, are there some precepts or some musts that need that you feel need to be done defensively whenever you play yeah. triple option? And do you spend maybe a little bit more time with Coach Golden being in the pro game and not around the, the triple option as much? Actually, you know, it's been an interesting day because, you know, yesterday I spent some time with him and there's a lot of really good ideas he's had from previously facing triple option teams. You know, when he was at uh, Temple, they faced Navy. And then when he was at Miami, they faced Georgia Tech. And so had some really good ideas and watched some film of different things they did defensively to give us uh, a new way to defend the triple option. So We'll enhance now. Obviously, there's some things we did last year that we had some success with, but um, there's a lot of good enhancements, I think, that the defense will have because of his expertise in defending the triple option. Second roll on your left, Sean Sires. Marcus, this season obviously could have easily unraveled after Stanford. Is there anything you, know, you did, said, changed, whatever, that got you from that point to Saturday night? Man, it could have unraveled after Marshall and many other ones, you know, but Again, it's the mindset of it's never going to be as smooth as you expect it to be. And that probably is said for a national championship team, a team that wins a national championship. Was that road to the national championship as you saw it to start a season? No. Same with us, right? That, that This road to where we are right now was never how you foresaw it to start the year. And that's the beauty of, of growth. And you know what? It's When we think about – hoisting a national championship trophy you think about beating a team like Clemson sometimes you don't think about how hard that's going to be you don't think about the difficulties of getting to that moment but um, if you continue to work intentionally not, not just work hard right everybody's going to say they work hard but what intentionality do you have in your work? Are you really addressing issues? Are you really changing? Are you really trying to enhance? Um, do you have belief in the foundation, the culture of what you're doing? You know, and uh, you work tirelessly, man. You, you work to find a better way to do it. That's one of the mantras we have, a challenge everything. Find a better way to do it. 
It wasn't good enough versus Marshall. It wasn't good enough versus Ohio State. What do we got to evaluate to find a better way to do it and a better way to execute and a better way to make sure we're playing better on Saturdays? And uh, I never lost a belief in that. And that's going to continue to be my mindset after a win. Is there a better way to do it? Is there a better way to play this game of football? Coach Mace, you've blocked five punts in the past four games. Find a better way to do it, right? And that's got to be the challenge because if you continue to just say, okay, we're good, we're just continue to do the same thing, you're going to get passed by because everybody else has that mindset. Everybody you're going to face has that mindset of we got to find a better way to catch up to somebody or find a better way to do it. And a coach's sideline demeanor might be – you know, just the most completely overanalyzed thing. But you you do seem more demonstrative over these last few games. Other than that, though, are you doing anything, you know, different on the sidelines, you know, when it comes to game day? You know, I think it's a reflection of this position you're in. Every day you get more and more comfortable. You learn something else, you know. Where I was in Oklahoma State and Ohio State as a head coach on the sideline is different to where I am now. And, and hopefully it's going to be different in another game or two games from now. Um, you know, part of it is is having conviction in the things you say, right? And it, if, if I feel strongly about something, I thought Drew, I thought it was targeting. I just looked and I thought it was. So I, I was upset, you know, and, and – as our team quickly reminded me, nobody's worth 15 yards. And I thought I had a 15-yard penalty, and that was devastating because I say to these guys every every so often, nobody in our football program is worth 15 yards, including the head coach. And I felt a, a, a disappointment. A couple of the guys said it to me on the sidelines. You're not, nobody's worth 15 yards, coach. Nobody's worth 15 yards. At that moment, I wanted to choke them, but I was like, no, get out of my <laughs> – but, um, you know, it's a great reminder of the belief – you know, and you can argue a point, but you gotta you gotta be smart. You know, and I can't lose my control either because you tell us, our players it's an emotional game, but you can't lose control. You know, same thing as a coach. And but I had a strong conviction of what I thought was a targeting call. It wasn't. You know, and after seeing the replay and talking to the officials, it wasn't. But um, you know, those are all parts about growing in this position. You know, be able to tell these referees things you see. Um, Welcome back to the Marcus Freeman Show, presented by TireRack.com. Coach, you guys have now moved to 6-3 and three on the season. you still got three games left, and obviously you want to take this momentum from the Clemson game the rest of the way. So what's the biggest key for you as a head coach and for this team to make sure there isn't a letdown going forward? Well, it starts with the preparation, and um, I have a strong belief in that the Saturdays reflect the preparation during the week, and, and that... You know what? We got to find a way to continue to enhance the way we prepare. We got to have that same mindset that we had after a Marshall or after Ohio State or after a Stanford that we have after a win over Clemson is that we have to be very intentional on our preparation and always chase improvement, mm -hmm. right? And that we're never satisfied with what happened the week before. How do the challenges, how do you become a better football team? And then Saturday, you go play. You get to go chance, go play in the game, but it's every day find a way to improve. This Saturday, obviously unique, you get Navy, of course, a service academy. There's a great history with Notre Dame and Navy, but then also they bring in the triple option. So just what's the focus this week as you get set for that one? You know, I've had some experience going against the triple option, but Coach Golden, our defense coordinator, has had a lot of experience going against it too in his time at Temple and at Miami, uh, Florida. And so, you know, the ability to put our plans together and figure out what's going to be best for this group of guys, but also to simulate that that offense is to the best of our ability in practice so our guys have a little idea of how fast it will be in the game is going to be a challenge for us. Coach, appreciate it. We'll talk to you next week. That'll do it for this week's edition of the Marcus Freeman Show, presented by TireAct.com.